Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Hope you're ready for a time of worship and edification and uh, spending some time praising our God and learning some things from His Word. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. A beautiful, sunny December morning. <laughs> Seems like uh, it's pretty comfortable out here. We're happy that you're all here. If you would, bow with me as we start our service. Holy Father, we thank you for every blessing in this life. We thank you, Lord, for this time we can be together, when we can enjoy part of the brilliant plan that you have for us of having each other and having the church so that we can edify one another and be together and strengthen one another. And Lord, we pray that you will always be with us, that you will be with us during this service and help everything that we do be done to your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. First song is The Lily of the Valley. <clears throat> to me, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me, while I live by faith into his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I'm nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Didn't bring a chair up, so I'll put this down there. I'm so glad that uh, we're able to be here, and I join in with um, Barry in welcoming you, and would ask you, if you would, please, to turn in your Bibles uh, to the 16th chapter uh, of the book of Acts. We're going to be looking there in that chapter in just a moment. We're ending up with our year in the series on faith uh, and uh, uh, Hebrews the 11th chapter and so many other individuals that we have talked about we're coming to an end in that in a couple of weeks and I just wanted to drop a little note about what we're going to do uh, for the next year I'm sure there'll be a more public announcement of that uh, but we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Acts uh, not in an expository form thank you very much not in an expository way where we would go verse by verse, but we're going to look at the book of Acts in, in, uh, uh, in a topical, doctrinal way. Every chapter of the book of Acts has something worth our uh, understanding as far as doctrine is concerned. Even the apostle, uh, even Luke would say, these are the things most surely believed. Uh, and so each chapter of, uh, uh, of Acts has a particular point of doctrine, perhaps more than, than just one, 
Uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 1, we'll be looking at uh, the ascension of Jesus and what that means. Uh, and uh, also looking at whether or not we have uh, apostles even yet on the earth today and the miracles that, uh, that uh, encourage them or help them to confirm uh, the Word of God. Of course, in chapter 2 is the beginning of the church, the apostles' doctrine, uh, those kinds of things. Not a verse-by-verse -verse study, uh, but rather a, uh, 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 an ex extrapolating of uh, doctrinal events uh, that occur in each of those chapters. Uh, I'm looking forward to my part in that uh, and hoping that uh, it'll be beneficial to all of us. As things most surely believed, um, perhaps some of them will be uh, of uh, uh, simply review for us, but others of them might be a new thing that you, you may not have heard as being a new Christian or uh, perhaps in your walk as a Christian it hasn't come out. So I look forward to that and look forward to, uh, to the opportunity uh, to take part of that. Uh, coincidentally, this morning, uh, Derek assigned me a, a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 16, particularly verse 15, if you'd like to turn there as we want to talk about that in just a few moments. Uh, and it uh, uh, concerns the, the idea of uh, whether or not we can find ourselves faithful uh, to the God of heaven. And the whole year we've been talking about faith. And so we ask a question this morning, is there a way to understand whether indeed we are faithful, whether indeed we are doing what God would, uh, would have us to do? So I hope you can, you can uh, help me to learn something out of these passages of Scripture, uh, and uh, maybe it will help us uh, as we try to live a, a Christian life. Uh, there's a particular phrase uh, in this verse that we're going to be looking at, uh, and that is when this uh, lady asked the Apostle Paul, uh, if you consider, if you've judged me faithful, come and stay at my place. Uh, and so we're going to look at that. Uh, it's interesting in a number of ways. When I first read it, uh, I thought maybe she was thinking about uh, her, her faithfulness as far as her word is concerned, uh, as far as her uh, economy was concerned, as far as her lifestyle was concerned. If you've judged me faithful, come stay with me. But as I read it over and over again, it became uh, more plain, more clear, that what she actually says was, if you have considered me faithful to the Lord, come stay at my place. And the Apostle Paul, of course, uh, uh, did just exactly that. Uh, and so, if you, if you are there, look at Acts chapter uh, 16, uh, and notice with me there, uh, verse, uh, beginning at verse uh, 11 uh, of, that, uh, of that chapter. Uh, this is Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, and uh, he's going to the Gentile nations particularly and teaching them about God's Word. Verse 11 of Acts 16, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. Uh, and the next day we came to Neapolis. And from there we went to Philippi, which is the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, or colony. We were staying in that uh, city for some time, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple, uh, and uh, from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so Paul then says she persuaded us to do that. More than likely, as we talk about uh, this lady, uh, Lydia, from Thyatira, we, we notice some things about her uh, from the very beginning. The first thing we notice is that she was a seller of purple. If you were a seller of purple, it meant that you were pretty well off uh, economically. Purple was the most expensive kind of dye uh, that uh, could be derived at that point in time in, uh, in history. And uh, if you were able to, to uh, have the materials and so forth that you would dye in purple, uh, they were very expensive to purchase. And so Lydia, at the very beginning, we recognize as being someone who uh, was prominent someone who was very, very wealthy. 
But we also recognize that Lydia coming from Thyatira was uh, a Gentile uh, as, uh, as a nationality is concerned. Uh, and Thyatira being a Roman colony, uh, we could just say she was a Roman in that, in that way. But it's interesting to note to me uh, that uh, this was a lady who was a Gentile and I kind of liken her to Cornelius back in chapter 10 where she was devout before the Lord. Scripture says she worshiped God uh, and her way of worship evidently uh, included a great deal of, of prayer even as Cornelius's did. Um, uh, prayed to God always. Uh, and it is interesting that here's the kind of a woman who had the heart uh, that she would listen to the things that the Apostle Paul would say. Uh, she could not be a part of the Jewish nation. She could be a proselyte Jew. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there was a, a, a difference made in their minds uh, between those who were proselyted and those who were ethnic Jews. So this woman faced, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, a great deal of, uh, uh, of uh, prominence. But on the other hand, she sacrificed that prominence in order to worship the God of heaven. And as it was a custom in that time and that place, uh, on the Sabbath day, which indicates she was trying to follow the Old Testament law, she found herself there probably by habit, uh, standing or sitting, whatever they did on the riverside, and praying uh, to God. So the words that she spoke to the Apostle Paul, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, suggest that there is a way to determine whether we are faithful or not. If she had said it another way, perhaps it would mean something else. But she asked the Apostle Paul to judge her according to her faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, sometimes, as we ask ourselves, uh, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Our answers are generally something very, uh, uh, not very specific, but general in, their nat in our nature. And we have to say, most of the time, uh, well, I hope that I'm going to go to heaven, or I pray that I'm going to go to heaven, or the Lord willing, I, I will go to, go to heaven. Uh, and we, we, we kind of uh, recoil when someone asks us that question. Instead of the way that Lydia asked the question, if you've judged me to be faithful, come into my house. And we're looking at that this morning so that we might be able to understand and ask ourselves the question and answer the question. Because in our minds, uh, I believe the Bible indicates there should be no question when someone asks us the, that, uh, that question, are we going to go to heaven when we die? We should be able to, with a great deal of affirmation and a great deal of confidence, say to the individual or to ourselves, yes, uh, I will go to heaven. I understand that we don't answer that way so that no one can say that we are prideful or full of hubris. But at the same time, in our hearts, we have to be confident about our relationship with the God of heaven. That's what the Apostle Paul would mean in uh, 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter and verse 5, when he said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Uh, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So notice the positive and the negatives even in that verse. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. That indicates that we are to ask ourselves, to look at ourselves, to determine whether we are faithful to God uh, or not. And then the Apostle Paul says, test yourselves. Put yourself through a, a test of sorts to determine whether or not you are faithful at that point uh, in your life before the God of heaven, before the Lord. And if we find ourselves to be not faithful to God, then you and I need to have the confidence in God to be able to go to him and, and make that right. And so what I'd like to do this morning, it's not certainly uh, an exhaustive list, but I would like to uh, draw our attention back to those individuals we've talked about uh, over the years, over, the, over this year, uh, and examine their lives and put it into maybe six different uh, points in our lives uh, where we can determine whether or not uh, we are faithful to God. Every one of the individuals that we referred to uh, will pass the test of what we're talking about 
uh, this morning in these six great things uh, that God has given to us to determine whether or not we can be judged faithful uh, in God, uh, in, the, in the Lord. And I think that as we go through them, you will see how all of these individuals, if we remember them at all, fit into these six different categories uh, that uh, illustrate and can answer to ourselves as we examine ourselves, even as we're going to do in just a few moments again, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper. The whole purpose is to look at ourselves and not to simply turn our, our eyes the other way. Not to, as James said, uh, look in the mirror and then turn away from the mirror without changing our lives. But rather, we are to be so confident in our faith before God uh, that we can answer the question, yes, if I died today, I believe uh, that I would go to heaven. And so let me look at these six things uh, before you this morning in a, in a very abbreviated form. It encompasses all that we've talked about during this last year, uh, and hopefully it will spur our hearts to look at ourselves uh, and to make the determination that when we find ourselves lacking, we will change. Uh, we, will, we will not look in the mirror uh, and then turn away. So here's the first thing that I would like to mention as far as all of those individuals are concerned, and that is that they were unwavering in their faith in the, in the promises uh, of God. I'm thinking of Hebrews the 11th chapter and verse 6. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seeking him and having unwavering faith in the God of heaven does not mean that we're not going to make uh, uh, mistakes and sin as we live in this life. But you look at every one of the individuals in, in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and you come away knowing that even though they goofed, even though they erred, even though they sinned, they always came back to the fact that God was the God of heaven uh, and that he would reward them for diligently seeking him. The basis of all of that faith was the promises that they made, that God made rather, uh, to them in, in, in uh, individuality. They would come back to those promises. Sometimes they didn't know exactly what those promises were, as we read. Sometimes they were unable to see the future uh, and the fulfillment of those, pro of, the, of those promises. But their unwavering faith in the God of heaven allowed them to live their lives uh, in, the, in the mean, uh, as God would have them to do. Even Abraham, whenever he was off, uh, told and, and uh, commanded to offer his son uh, Isaac as a sacrifice. He didn't know what God was going to do. He didn't realize how that would work out as far as God's plan was concerned. But he thought in his mind, he said if, if uh, and I'm paraphrasing very, very loosely, but it gives the point. He thought in his mind that if God said Isaac was the promised seed, then somehow if I offer Isaac as a sacrifice, God will come through and God will perhaps raise him from the dead never having seen anyone raised from the dead before. His unwavering faith in God and the promise that God made uh, allowed him to go through that, uh, that must, what must have been a horrible situation. So as we look at that, no matter what happens to us as, uh, as individuals, you and I have to stay strong and we have to stay immovable in our belief in him who made us and our belief in him who created us and our belief who, in him who saved us and promised eternal life and called us his very own. Uh, and we have to do that based upon the promises uh, of God. And the point of all of that is that faithful Christians do not act on the circumstances in which they find themselves. They act on the values and the promises and the principles of God. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 after talking about the promise of the resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Paul would say, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Sometimes it gets tired to be a Christian. Sometimes we wear ourselves out. But we cannot allow that uh, exhaustion to, to move us away from God. 
And even though in these instances, like Abraham again, waited for 10 years, he never moved himself away from the promises of God. The second thing that I would notice to us as we, we can even read it uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and that is this, I'm thinking of Noah at this point. And what we have to do as a Christian, if someone asks us if we're saved or not, we have to look within ourselves and recognize that we have separated ourselves from the world's thoughts and the world's patterns and the world's practices. You think of, uh, of, the, of Noah and the day of his life. And in the day of his life, God identified him as the only individual that was living by grace. Everybody else in the entire world at the time, everybody else uh, was uh, following their own hearts and their own desires and their thoughts were only evil continually. But here was Noah, uh, a man of faith. Uh, and this individual, Noah, separated himself from the rest of the world. Because what you and I must do, being a citizen of heaven, is set our mind on things that are above and things that are in heaven, not on things on this earth. We have to study the word according to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have to recognize what the world's patterns are and be sure that we separate ourselves from that. Of course, the apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to, to, the, to, the, to the Lord. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen to how Paul said it in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, whenever, whenever he was talking about fellowship. In that passage of scripture, he said, separate yourselves from the world. In that passage of scripture, he, he said, Christians have no fellowship uh, with sin. And so the point being, if I am dabbling in sin, if there's a sin that's ongoing in my life, if there's something that I'm doing that is not according to God's word, then if I'm going to be judged faithful, I have to stop. There's no other way of saying that, except that I have to put that away. I can't fool, I might be able to fool myself. But I'm not going to be able to fool God if I'm not separate from the thoughts and the patterns and the practices of the world. The way I dress, the way I act, the way I am uh, uh, and talking to others, the attitudes that I have toward, toward this life are all included in separating ourselves from the thoughts and the practices of the world. Listen to how Paul said it in Colossians chapter 3. He says, if you were then raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And then notice the, the specificity that he talks about. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because upon these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another, since you put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all, uh, and, and uh, excuse me, Christ is all and in all. A passage of scripture carefully delineates the kind of life and mind that you and I are to have. And so we ask ourselves this question again, if you have judged me faithful, there's no way, again, of saying it. If we have a practice in our lives, perhaps we're angry and been angry for years. Perhaps we have malice for someone uh, and uh, we have not taken care of that before God and that individual. Uh, we cannot fool ourselves into thinking that we're faithful to God. We cannot harbor that kind of anger and malice uh, and idolatry, if that's the case, and still be pleasing to God. The begging is this morning 
Let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we're faithful if indeed we're not. That's why we are to examine uh, ourselves. The third thing that I'd like to notice very quickly uh, is that we are, uh, are to avoid. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I pushed this up too far. If I, can, if I can get back to there, then I'll know what to say. Uh, the third thing that I, to, that I would like to notice uh, is that what we're supposed to do is that we're always to choose what the right thing to do. Uh, I'm thinking of Rahab in chapter 11. Uh, I'm thinking of all those at the end of the chapter that received their dead back to life, that were persecuted, that lost everything that they had, and yet they chose to do what was right uh, every, uh, every time uh, in, their, uh, in, in their lives and doing uh, what, uh, what God wanted them to do. And the point of it is, if I would want to be faithful to God, even if it hurts, even if I lose what I'm going to, what we're going to lose, do what is right. Always be pleasing to God all of the time. And when I'm faced with making a decision in my life, what I'm to do at that time is to choose the one that isn't sinful. Choose the one that the Bible indicates is pleasing to God, even if it means that I'm ridiculed even if it means uh, that I am persecuted for the belief that I have. If I'm to be judged faithful before the Lord, I have to make the right choices. Uh, and so uh, as, we, uh, as we look at that uh, and understand that, again, Christians do not act upon the circumstance in which they find themselves. They act upon the values of God. John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. He would say again in 1 John, I Keep my commandments and my commandments are not grievous. It's one thing to say I love the Lord. It's one thing to, uh, uh, to say that I am, am doing what God would have me to do. It's another thing altogether to actually do it. This is what the, the Jews were guilty of in the time of Jesus. He said, you, with your lips you honor me, but with your heart you're far from me. And so let's make it, make it plain as we can as we uh, are winding this year of faith down. If indeed I want to be judged faithful to the Lord, it can't be a haphazard thing. It has to be something that I do all of the time. The fourth thing that I'd like to notice uh, is that in these passages of Scripture as far as uh, as uh, doing what God would have us to do and being faithful to Him, the point is made that I am, by example, to love, uh, love my neighbor uh, as myself. I'm thinking of uh, Abraham uh, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, Abraham, as we know his life, uh, Abraham was uh, an individual who entertained angels unaware of. We can read that uh, all about that. That was an aspect of his faith. Uh, his faith just not did not just keep it within himself, but his faith allowed him to share what he had with other individuals. When Jesus was presenting a judgment scene in Matthew 25, uh, he would say, I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was in prison and you didn't come to visit me. Uh, and they would ask him, when did, we, when did we see you in those positions? And he would, say, he would say to them, if you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it to me. One of the things that condemned the Jewish nation was that they forgot their neighbors uh, and they spent their goods upon themselves and themselves uh, alone. So let's, let's be frank about the point is that we're living, if we're living our lives within ourselves, never having contact with those outside the body of Christ, turning a, a blind eye to those that might need our help, we are indeed answering in a negative way, am I faithful to the Lord? Because God is watching us, as the scriptures indicate. He sees how we treat our brothers and our sisters, as well as those that are are not a part of the flock of, 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 of God. And so the fourth thing is, is about, is about looking at our neighbors 
and treating them uh, as we ought. Uh, that's the fifth thing, actually. The last thing that I, I want to mention is that throughout the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we find out that every one of the individuals that are described as having that faith, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Rahab, by faith Esther, and all of the others that are mentioned in chapter 11, the way that we look at that passage of Scripture indicates that if I'm judged to be faithful, then what I have to do is do what those individuals did. And those individuals were not afraid to take risks with our faith. Abraham left all of his prosperity in the Ur of Chaldees to follow God. Noah received all of the, the, the cursing and all of the, the uh, ridicule about building an ark and talking about some kind of a flood that was coming when it had never happened before. Rahab uh, risks, uh, risked her life to, to house those spies that came in to search out Jericho. Esther risked her life before the, the king so that she could save her people, Israel. Those individuals that believed God risked their families and some of them lost their families uh, because of the risk. Lydia said, if you judge me faithful to the Lord, here's one aspect of that. And I urge all of us as we strive in this world to live lives of faith. We be willing to take the risks that faith sometimes offers to us. The unfaithful man of Matthew chapter 25 again took the talent that God had given to him and was afraid to take the risk. He said, I'm afraid. And so he buried that portion of his faith in the backyard and said to God, here it is. And God called him, you unfaithful, unprofitable servant. That ought to spur each of us to recognize the fact that if we have the faith and we're judged faithful before God, that we take the risks in our life. Every one of the heroes of faith that we've talked about if we really examine their lives, we can see all of these six principles to be uh, in effect in their life. There may be more, probably are. But as I looked at it again this week, uh, it, uh, it just simply jumped out at me uh, that each of these individuals displayed these characteristics. Uh, I imagine that Lydia did as well. So can we know whether or not we are faithful to God. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 uh, and, uh, and verse 16 uh, in that, of that passage of Scripture. After talking about living in the flesh and living in the Spirit, the Apostle Paul would say in verse 16 and 17, he would say, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are joint heirs with Christ. So I want to focus on that, that first phrase. The Spirit itself, the Word of God, bears witness with our spirit, that's which, that which is within us, that we are children of God. And if we're children of God, then we are joint heirs with Christ. And so it occurs to me as we read these kinds of passages to examine ourselves, to make sure we're not walking within, uh, in sin, uh, to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper in a way that allows us to see whether we are faithful or not. And look in, within God's Word and have the Word of God bear witness to us that we're children of God. And if I look within that Word of God and find something lacking in my life, I may need to take a risk. Uh, I, may, I may need to change my mind about the world's patterns and thoughts. I, need to go, I need, may need to go to a neighbor because I've ignored them before and not helped them out. That's what God's Word says. And the Spirit as God's Word. We look at that Word, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and we inculcate that into our lives. It becomes a way to understand whether we're faithful or not. If we cannot answer the question, if you judged me faithful, then we have the opportunity today and tomorrow, if tomorrow comes, 
to judge that, to answer that question in the affirmative. Because all it takes, by the grace of God, is to come back to Him, change our lives, and make sure that we are living according to the, His pattern and not the world's pattern. Is there any doubt in your mind as to whether you would be saved today or not? If the Lord would come. If the doubt is there, you can erase that doubt. Looking into the scriptures, and taking it perhaps line by line, and examining whether or not we're faithful before God. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Our Father in the heaven, we bow before you as humbly as we know how, recognizing that you are the creator and the giver of eternal life. I pray that we might live our lives so that uh, we live it to a view, with a view toward eternity. And whatever we might find lacking in our lives, we will have enough bravery, we will have enough strength to be unwavering in our faith and to come back to you. Help us to examine ourselves in a proper fashion and do so with your, your pattern in mind. In Jesus' name we say, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate you listening to that. Appreciate you as an audience. You're always uh, very splendid in that regard. If we can help you in any way, it's a little awkward to ask that out here. Ask it afterwards. If we can pray for you uh, and uh, help your life, if you need to come to the Lord and initial obedience and baptism, we can take care of that as well. Whatever your need might be, won't you come? Uh, as together we stand and sing. Me so Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. <clears> the <throat> cross you died for me. I will try to live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Please be seated. When you ask your four-year-old for a song se selection, <laughs> you kind of have to say yes. Everybody. Good Can you hear me all right? Good. We'll say it is always a pleasure to look at everybody from this perspective, even though I can't see your part of your faces. 
I can tell by this squinting when you're smiling. <laughs> it's a pleasure to uh, take this moment. And I want to read uh, from John 18, starting in verse 33. It reads, Therefore Pilate entered the praetorium again and summoned Jesus and said to him, You are the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? We know it's a fact that Jesus was sent from heaven by God, and the, by God the Father, and in an awesome plan of love, and that Jesus was absolutely sent here to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins, even on a cross. Jesus is truth. He is our truth. And we are here to closely consider this truth and the beauty that it is for us who believe the truth. And we have this opportunity together to worship our Lord and Savior because of these truths. If you would like to prepare your wafer, bread. And then if you'll pray with me, please. Father in heaven, thank you for a beautiful day, another day that we are truly blessed, so many things to be thankful for, but right now we're very thankful that we can freely gather here in your love to reflect upon your love, your plan, and the love of your Son, who willingly gave up heaven to be the key piece of that plan of salvation. We know that Jesus came here in the flesh amongst us to be that representation of truth and we believe in your son that he did in fact put his body on that cross and suffered and died for us and for that we are truly and eternally grateful thank you father for your son it's through him and it's in his name Jesus Christ that we pray to you We also know it's a fact that Jesus was the perfect lamb, perfect sacrifice, and his precious blood is the only thing that can provide the payment we owe for our sins. Truly, there is power in the blood. If you'll pray with me again, please. God, our Father in heaven, Heavenly Father, loving Father, we 
come to you to continue our reflection of your son, of his blood that was shed on the cross today, that payment of our sins could be paid. And a beautiful thing that there's such power in that blood and in that sacrifice that it wasn't just for those there at that time when that sacrifice was made, but for all, for all time. We're so grateful for your son. that he followed your commandment, was willing and determined to learn obedience in a way not carried out before. I pray that you be with us as we drink of this through the vine that we can consider to, or continue to consider ourselves examine ourselves where we stand in this relationship and how beautiful of a relationship it is and is to be forever again because of your son and his blood we praise you god and we praise your son jesus christ who sits at your right hand in heaven it's in jesus name that we pray amen That concludes the Lord's Supper, and as we often do, we take the time to give back to, I guess now maybe, since we're not physically doing it, consider that and contemplate giving back. In John 10, from the passage about the Good Shepherd, a small piece of that reads, I am the door, and if anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. Focusing primarily on that last piece and have it abundantly. Something else when Jesus Christ is saying that. He knows what that means. <laughs> I think we have a clue as to what that means. I look forward to seeing what that fully means. I guess if we consider all that he's given us, which is everything, he gave his life. He's with us while we're on this earth. His spirit dwells in us. And then again, because of his sacrifice, we have eternal life, more so in heaven, with him, with the Father, with all those who live in that love. So I guess the thought is, uh, we're of course to be like God and be like Jesus and be generous, uh, considering others before ourselves. God wants us to give back a portion of what he's given us. And that makes, gosh, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So if you would, let's give thanks to God for that. God, our Father in heaven, we 
come to you additionally now at this time to speak love to you, to your son again, through your son again. Thankful for so many blessings. We sing songs about it sometimes, counting them. Couldn't if we tried, only you are able to know how truly deep and how full and abundant those blessings are. We know that we are supposed to be like you and your son, and a part of that is being filled with loving kindness and joy and generosity and giving back to you what you've given us or sharing what you've given us. I pray that you would continue to fill our hearts while we live in this world, that we can continually, as part of having you and your son in the forefront of our minds, be focused and ready for those opportunities to be generous and to give back and to have a heart that is truly desiring to do that, not being selfish, not holding back, and looking for opportunities to be creative, to generate those opportunities for giving back. Thank you, Father, for loving us in the way that you and your son love us that is like nothing else. We love you, we love your son. We pray all this again in Jesus' name, amen. If you would please stand, we'll sing our last song, 448, The Greatest Commands. Barry give us our announcements afterwards to close. I know we haven't sung this one in a while because it's parts and we're all outside so we're going to give it a try and uh, sing out the best you can. Love one another for love is of God. He is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. Love For 
God is love, God is love, God is love. Please be seated. family news and announcements. Um, today marks the beginning of uh, our new quarter for classes. The college age uh, met this morning at 9 o'clock uh, at 11.15. Oh look, just a few minutes. Uh, everybody's, uh, you all look too, I saw every one of you. <laughs> uh, at 11.15 classes for uh, twos and three year olds up through high school will be in the various rooms. Uh, so if you can participate in that, uh, get your kids in there, that'd be great. And then tonight at 5 o'clock on uh, Zoom, there is a uh, study starting in uh, Amos in the Old Testament and uh, one of the minor prophets. And you know what? You're shut in anyway. There's really no excuse for you not to be there at 5 o'clock. Can't go anywhere and do anything anyway, so <laughs> might as well enjoy a good Bible study. We're starting a new, a new quarter there, and then again on Wednesday night at 7, there will be a Zoom class and also a Facebook uh, live stream uh, on Christian Attitudes, and uh, that, that will be at Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, as you all know, uh, this past week, our brother, or a week ago today, our brother Stan uh, Stout passed away. Uh, they'll be having a very small family burial, basically, um, at the military uh, facility. Uh, and then sometime, as you all know, uh, Stan worked a lot with uh, folks across the border. And uh, until the borders open, Carol would prefer to wait and have a memorial for him and a celebration of life at a time when the borders open and people can come from whichever direction. So that uh, we'll get you more information on that as uh, when we know that. But uh, for now, uh, there's nothing planned other than a small family um, burial. Uh, also, uh, Ernie Shepard, who uh, is Carla Roman's father, passed away this last week. Uh, please pray for that family. And then just to top it off, uh, Lily Tapper's grandfather passed away uh, in Mexico this last week. Uh, please pray for that family, especially for her mom, uh, who has to go down and try to settle all the arrangements and property and everything down there and evidently she's also suffering with a lot of guilt about what she might should have done um, and sometimes that happens when people uh, leave this earth you wonder you know what could I have done more whether to make a closer relationship or to us as Christians uh, teach them about Christ and uh, bring them into God's Word so keep that in mind uh, Derek Victor and his family are at home today um, Derek was having some symptoms on Friday or Saturday and went and got a COVID test. Uh, doesn't have results yet, so he's staying home so that we don't all have to stay home, uh, which is a good thing, uh, until he gets those results back. Uh, visitors, uh, we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, if you got a visitor's card, if you would, please put it in the uh, baskets over there on the table. Uh, when you leave uh, or hand it to someone. If you didn't get one, there's one over there for you to fill out. And uh, we really appreciate that so we can acknowledge your visit and if you have any needs, let us know that. Um, also, uh, this morning with Derek not being here, Andrew is uh, breaking all this stuff down and doing that. So if you're sitting in a chair that is a regular folding chair, if you wouldn't mind taking it over there and putting it underneath for the Hispanic service that starts at uh, uh, noon. The, they that's just set it over there as best you can. They'll arrange them. But just if you get them there, that would be great. Uh, we would appreciate that. I think I got everything. If you would please stand, and we'd be led in our closing prayer. Let us all bow. Our oh, dear heavenly Father, Creator of the heavens and the earth cosmos your God we're so mindful right now we pray collectively we stand through your grace and your mercy and humbleness we stand strong because we are your people 
pray we won't be judged faithful like Lydia. Something that you have simply because you had said so, you have said so, and it is right for us. We pray we will honor and glorify your name for whatever lies ahead. We pray us here as, as your people, we go strong and live well. Pray for Christians throughout the world. Whatever may lie ahead of them, be with them. Help us to be your people throughout the world as well. Pray for Carol Stout. Be upon them and their family. As well as Jolene and Dottie. Pray for the Romans family and the Tappers. Because we pray for our current eldership, be with the Bales and Swames and the McConaughey's. We pray everybody here and through our congregation virtually and on site, whether it's young children, the high school, the college, the singles, the young families, the elderly, and established families, they're older, we pray. You'll continue to be over us and we, we will go well each and every day. Thank you for your love for us, how you have done and you will do in the future. We pray in Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen.